Welcome back to another weekly GMBN Tech Show. Coming up on the show this week, we check out the new stuff from Gyro. As well as the Trek Slash, which is finally released. There's also a new alloy bike from Mondraker. And Cane Creek's brand new shock. Okay, so straight into news, and first up, we're gonna talk about a couple of new things from Giro. Uh, the first of which is this helmet on screen. Now, this is called Source. It's available in five colors in men's, three colors in women's, a whole host of different sizes, and it retails for 120 US dollars, or about 125 uh, euros. Now, what's so special about this helmet? Well, it's a pretty good price and it's fully featured. So it's based around a MIPS system on the inside. So that is the uh, rotational injury prevention system, or at least it's supposed to help prevent injury from rotational injuries or oblique impacts when your helmet essentially sort of rotates as it hits the floor. Um, it's supposed to isolate it from your head and it does that very well. Now it's also got the fifth iteration of the Rock Lock system. Now Rock Lock is a cradle to support the back of your head and hold your helmet onto your head securely. Now, this, this is exclusive to Giro in the 90s when it came out with the first system of the Rock Lock. And many other brands have obviously followed suit because it really is the best way to cradle your head and get a good fit from a helmet. Uh, as always, the fit is excellent with Giro helmets. Uh, like I said, there was 16 vents on here. It's got a nice big peak at the front, a nice deep coverage at the rear. The peak has uh, metal hardware on there and you can get it up and out of the way if you want to fit your goggles with it. Now, what do you think of the pricing on this? I think this is a really good price. It's a fully featured helmet, okay? It's not quite up there with the top of the range ones, which have more features on there, like the spherical MIP system, like the ball socket style. But I think it's a great helmet at a good price. Um, I certainly don't have an issue with the pricing of helmets. A lot of people I have heard think their helmets are overpriced. Um, I, think, I think that's crazy. When you look at the cost of bikes, and the only one thing you absolutely categorically need to ride a bike is a helmet to protect your head. Um, if your head's not working properly, you're never gonna be able to ride a bike again. Bones heal, remember, your head doesn't heal in the same way. Now, I'd love to know from what everyone thinks in the comments underneath, what do you think is overpriced for a trail style helmet? What do you think is seen as reasonable? Of course, you know, with inflation and everything else in the world, helmet pricing has gone up. Once upon a time, this helmet probably would have been about 50 or 60 quid in the UK, and of course now it's nearly double that um, on costing, but I don't see it's a bad thing. I always think you should buy the best helmet you can afford. Of course, we do know their helmets do have to fit base standards. I've made videos about this in the past, but you get better features, you get better quality of uh, materials on there. So yeah, definitely follow up in the comments. Love to know what you think. What's too expensive? Uh, what would you pay for a helmet and pricing, more or less? Okay, next up is a pair of shoes from Giro. Now, they've been doing shoes for a long time, and in fact, one of my all-time favorite shoes was the Terra Giro. Um, I've still got a black pair down there, and a kind of, they, uh, they were like a loud orange color once upon a time. They kind of look like a, I don't know, a pastel shade pink these days, which I guess could be kind of current, but um, they're never gonna get worn again, I mean, let's face it. So this is the shoe on screen. Uh, it's suitable for XC trail or even gravel, if you wanna pitch it that way. Uh, it's just an all-round off-road shoe. Now it's got the latest Boa L6 retention system on the top there, and it's got a hook and loop strap at the front so you can really tailor the fit to suit your, suit your foot. Now, a couple of cool things about the shoe itself. It's obviously got a very aggressive sole on there, suitable for uh, hiker bike sort of sections. You can fit studs on the front if you need to. And it's got nice long channels on there for fitting the cleats. So you can have the cleats in a nice rearward position, as well as a more effective position around the ball for, for all round pedaling. Um, why would you want to run the cleats so far back? Well, if you're into flat pedals, um, it can give you a very similar ride. A lot of aggressive riders like the cleats quite far back on the shoes. Now, the upper is kind of an interesting construction. So they call it a one-piece film stroke mesh bonded upper. Now, this is something you're seeing coming across from the hiking industry and the running sports, where they're using a single material. And this is great because it gives loads of support, but it feels like a sock to put on. It feels really supple, but as soon as you tighten it, it becomes like a structure. Uh, really interesting concept and very comfortable. No doubt these are gonna be great shoes because, uh, well, let's face it, Shiro have always made really good shoes. Uh, again, love to see what you think of them in the comments. There's three colors in uh, the men's version, a single color in the women's version, which is basically the same, just comes in some different sizing. Um, I think the olive and the gum sole one is the one. I'd have that tomorrow. I think that's an awesome looking shoe. Uh, let us know what you think in the comments. Now over to Henry with something new from Trek. So this week finally saw the release of the new Trek Slash. I say finally because back in February at the Andes Pacifico, I was talking to Pedro Burns, who is one of Trek Factory Racing's enduro riders, and he was insinuating a new bike was just around the corner. Now, I don't know if it was due to 
a lot of the delays that bike manufacturers have suffered or they were just waiting for the start of the EWS season. But it is finally here, the long awaited Trek Slash. So what is different about this bike compared to the previous generation? So first up is the Travel. This one now has 160 at the back, so 10 mil more, as well as a 170 fork. And they seem to be opting for the Zeb sort of style of new super enduro fork, you could call them. The new generation also has a compartment in the down tube for storage. Now that can be for snacks, which may be up to your own discretion, or indeed for any parts that you need to service your bike on the trail. So things like inner tubes or tools. Now the frame weight, including that new compartment, is actually down at a very svelte, 2,450 grams. Now, sometimes we talk about XC race bikes, which obviously come in at not far off half that weight, but this is an enduro race bike. So it's actually remarkably light, or at least I think it is. Now, another difference is a change to the setup of the knock block. Now, the knock block, for those of you that don't know, was a system that Trek employed to stop the handlebars ever going parallel with the top tube. This was done to stop either parts of the fork or the handlebars themselves hitting the frame and potentially damaging it. Now, this was kind of done for a couple of reasons, but most notably because Trek employed a straight down tube, one that didn't have any bend in it to accommodate the crowns of your forks having to go underneath. Now, this one is actually designed slightly differently, so it means they can not only run a wider angle of the knock block, but they're even letting it be now removed completely from the bike if it doesn't suit your preference. That's not all, there's also a full sleeve down tube protection, so pretty much from head to toe of the whole down tube is now protected. And for the press fit phobes, it comes with a threaded bottom bracket. So that's gonna really, really please some people who just aren't keen on pressed bottom brackets of any description. Trek also have a long history with the Slash. In fact, a lot of their trail bikes of using something a bit different in terms of the shock, and this one is no different. So this uses the new through shaft shock, which also has a piggyback, but apparently the piggyback there isn't meant for oil expansion. It still moves in one single column, but it's there to handle any kind of change in oil volume due to heat but it's also got a really cool little thing. The rebound knob is numbered to make it extra easy to remember your settings, which seems like a bit of a masterstroke to me. It's a bit kind of, kind of a slap in the face. You're just like, why didn't we do that before? But it looks absolutely great. Now the geometry itself is a bit more progressive than the previous version. So the head angle in its slackest setting comes down to 64.1 degrees, but that could be made half a degree steeper. And the seat angle in its slacker setting, although yet again, could be made steeper, is 75.6 degrees. The reach is a bit more healthy, kind of keeping it in line with the trend of enduro bikes getting a bit longer. So it starts at 425 and goes all the way up in about you know, 20 to 30 more increments to a 516 in the low setting for an XL. Now that actually the reach, of course, the way you position the bike does also have a little bit of play depending which setting you put it into. Builds themselves start at three and a half thousand US dollars and that comes in at 2,650 pounds. Now what's interesting is actually the 9.8, that's one down from the kind of the ultimate setup, but still comes with a carbon frame. For the same money, you can choose either GX or XT, which is really gonna suit a lot of people because you know, personally, I know lots of people that are either SRAM or Shimano and they never want to cross over and they're loath to kind of change. So I think that's a really cool thing and I'd love to see more bike companies offer that, just the choice to choose. Now you can of course use Project One if you want to go into the ultra customizable, but that basic choice I think is going to prove very popular indeed. Next in the news, Cane Creek release a new shock, their Kitsuma, and it looks, well, it's certainly a cool looking bit of kit. So. A lot of companies, I think, actually owe a lot to Cane Creek for mountain bike suspension because their, their double barrel shock was well ahead of the curve and it came out probably about well, a long time ago now, it must be over 10 years, it was, it was a fairly long time. And it really did set the trend of what, you know, what bike suspension rear, rear shocks would look like. And it's still a remarkably good shock. This one actually is kind of, I would say a refinement of a lot of those principles. So it actually has a very wide range of adjustability. Now, normally with shocks, they have a, a tune which is suited to the bike or indeed the rider, and that's then sold on, on the bikes and then you get them and you have to kind of use that window adjustment that's available. But this actually has 
a wider range of adjustability, which moves away from independently tuned shocks, which is going to be really, really positive if you're somebody that loves to kind of fine tune your shock, or indeed, you know, we get asked about it a lot for people that ride particularly aggressively or particularly hard, or on the other end of the spectrum, maybe they're very light, and they can often struggle with, um, with the factory tunes on shocks. So this is gonna give them more options. Now, you can also see where the adjustment is, which I think sometimes, you know, shocks can be a little bit intimidating, especially for kind of, you know, you begin into intermediate market. But this one is hoping to break that down by making things more visible. And, you know, it's gonna, enable people to understand where their shock is more. So that it's very easy to see where you are in the rebound or compression adjustment. So the low speed circuits are controlled with that dial within one revolution and the high speed within two. So it's gonna be very easy to replicate settings or even just add a little bit more without having to count the clicks. It's also got very clear labeling, just slow, fast, soft and firm. And they're really kind of breaking it down. I think Cane Creek, Sometimes people have almost been like, you know, intimidated because their shocks you know, look like some kind of small oil refinery and they're just very complicated. But these ones, I think are kind of to introduce people a bit more and, and show they, they need not be scared. Now the climb switch, yet again, with clear labeling has three settings. So you know, you're kind of descend, trail and climb mode. And it also has a larger internal shaft diameter with more of an emphasis on bushing overlap. So similar to what RockShox did, I with, suppose, with the, um, the Super Deluxe, is they're actually making the shock stiffer laterally and under torsional load. That means it's gonna perform better by not having any kind of flex in it, or at least reducing the flex, which is definitely the direction you want to go in. It's also got a lower profile and the piggyback is a lot shorter, at least sits a lot higher. What that means is that it's gonna have less problems fouling on frames. So it's gonna fit more bikes. Yet again, a really, really positive step. And I think it's gonna make a lot of people very happy. In terms of pricing, it comes in at 700 US dollars or 630 pounds. Okay, now something from Spain. This is the Mondraker Summum Alloy. So this is their top flight downhill race bike. And notice it's now in alloy. Uh, last year and now in previous years, we've seen the carbon version. There has been alloy options out there, but back at full flight in alloy, which is kind of interesting. Now, apparently uh, the top pro riders that were used in R&D development loved the feel of alloy. So this is what they're really pushing at the moment. Although I do suspect, knowing Mondraker, there will be an absolute weapon of a carbon bike coming much later down the line when they refine the ride qualities. Uh, you've got to bear in mind the carbon, on, especially on a downhill bike, I think it's gonna be a lot harder to get just right because you've got to have the perfect blend of stiffness on the front end with the, uh, the grip ratio, basically. If you have it too stiff, you're gonna stiff if you're gonna be pinging off stuff and downhill really at the speed you're riding and the way you're riding stuff you just can't have a bike that's overly stiff it's got to work correctly so uh, more on that when it comes back in fact we'll probably follow up with a detailed video actually on kind of sort of the dynamics of carbon frames and how they work because uh, i think it's kind of interesting what you can actually do with the different layups of carbon and i know that uh, for a fact in particular with the previous summer when it came out in carbon um, all of the work they've done on the frame so many different layups to get the bike riding how they wanted it to Anyway, back to this one, enough waffling. It's available in 27 half, 29, and a mixed wheel option, uh, where you can set it up mixed wheel style. Now, interestingly, this isn't something that Mondraker wanted to push, but um, they've made it acceptant and made it available because some of the team riders and test riders uh, really wanted to ride it in that style. And of course, it has been very popular on the World Cup, so um, who are they to say no? But 29, I think, is definitely what they're sort of aiming towards. So there's three models. There's the, the Summum, there's the R, there's the RR, and of course, there's the frame only. Uh, complete builds are available from 4,199. Uh, and of course, let's look at the geometry on the thing. So they're calling it their Stealth Evo Alloy. Uh, four sizes, so the reach goes from 430 up to 500 mil. Uh, the middle sizes, so it's 430, 450, 475, and 500 mil. So that's a really quite a long bike. Now, Mondraker were the pioneers in this sort of long wheelbase in terms of downhill bikes. And of course, they took that to trail bikes a bit later on, but they used a the downhill bike as a place to develop that. Now, the head angle on there is 63 and a half degrees, but you can adjust it with the cups that they make available. They're optional cups, so you can go plus, minus one degree or two degrees. Uh, depending on your preferences and I guess the race courses that you're intending on racing the thing down. This is after all a race bike. It's not a casual weekend to bike for a bit of fun. Well, you probably could have fun, but uh, let's, let's make no mistake, this thing's a beast. So 58 mil offset with 
with a 29, 52 mil offset uh, with the 27 and a half inch wheel options, 450 mil chain stays on there. What else do you need to know? Um, they've overhauled the whole back end on it. It's still running the zero suspension system, but they've revised the kinematics completely. Apparently this thing just sticks to the floor. Not that it was bad before. Um, so curious to see how good the bike is now. Uh, it's definitely beefed up a lot more. It's got double row uh, bearings on there, enduro bearings as well. They've gone for the max capacity load ones as well. So I think they're really intending this bike on being a heavy hitter. Um, I think it looks like an absolute beast. I mean, I've always been a fan of Mondraker bikes. They've got that line just right. The geometry is bang on. The sizing, I mean, 500 mil down a bike for me. <laughs> Bang on, but um, I don't ride down a box anymore, but I uh, definitely would like to have a go on one of these. Uh, what do you guys think? Let us know in the comments. And would you prefer them to make a carbon one or would you have the alloy? And which version would you have? 27 and a half, 29, or would you go for the mixed wheel in the middle? Uh, let us know in those comments. So now it is time for the tech quiz. So first question, fingers on buzzers. The Trek Slash over the years has been available in all of the three main wheel sizes. So 26, 27.5 and 29. True or false? So has it been available in all those wheel sizes? Get thinking. The second question, what was Cane Creek previously known as? So back in the day, there was kind of a different name for this company and what was it? The third question is the summum has now gone back to alloy, but for years it was actually a carbon downhill bike. What year did that bike first break cover? So what year did the summum go carbon? Now we're gonna have the release date as well as the model year. So uh, cover the bases a little bit and you'll have to tune in later on to get the answers. So now it is time for Bike Cave. Now this is the part of the show where we get to show off what you sent in. So if you have your own submission to send, please click the uploader in the description below and get into the show and hopefully we can feature it. So this week's first submission is from Wade out in Vermont. And he says this is his bike cave built to maintain his fleet during the race season. But sadly, it's not getting too much use at the moment as he's temporarily moving out to Montana. So, I mean, it looks well equipped. You've got your skis, got your bikes. And that's what's cool about living in a mountain town. If, you, uh, if you're keen on both is you can, you know, you have no off season really because you just get to ski or, or board if that's your cup of tea and ride bikes. Some cool looking bikes there, they're kind of obscured. You mentioned in your, uh, in your description there, there's an SB65 hides in a way. But uh, no, they, I mean, they look pretty decked out rigs, whatever they are. And is that like a surfboard I see? Very nice. And of course, the, the dog relaxing, which is actually probably like, you know, like I said, if you, if you get a dog in a bike cave, that's, that's when you get on the show, basically. That's, that's how easily I'm swayed. And the next submission is from Dorian in Switzerland. So another very mountainous place. And he said they had to build this bike cave with a limited space. So they, had, they, they decided to go for a magnetic tool board to hold the tools in place. And now they're feeling like a five-star chef putting the tools back in place instead of the knives. And yeah, that does actually look really good, eh? Super clean, magnetic boards are great for, I mean, often not necessarily everything, but they definitely have their place and it actually does look really, really tidy. Everything's there, nice clean workbench, fantastic stuff. And you've got some drawers as well. Truing stand, I mean, that's a well-equipped workshop. And a Go Banana apron, <laughs> lovely, <laughs> nice. And the next submission is from Hayden in Australia. This looks like a pretty good setup. You know, everything's very neat in its place. A good size workbench with loads of storage underneath for, you know, power tools, etc. Very well lit as well, which is, I'm a big fan of. And a fair few bikes kicking about too. I can't really see them too much. Is that a Kona on the end possibly? It's interesting, I mean, obviously these bikes probably have different people, you know, different sizes, etc. But you just look at the wheelbase of a modern trail bike. It's absolutely mahusive. But no, all very well tidied up. You've got your helmets there. Lovely job. That looks really, really good. Thank you very much for sending that hint, Hayden and everyone else. And guys, please keep them coming and hopefully we can have yours on the show next week.
Okay, now it's time for top mods, and we've got a very special bike to show you. Uh, this has actually been floating around on the web the last few days, but it's actually was sent to us by Mark himself. So this is a little shot of the bike on screen, um, and it's one of the coolest builds I've seen. Now, to a lot of you that won't really recognize the relevance of this, it just looks like a crazy color bike with everything going on, uh, and it is. But there's a really cool story with this bike. So I'm just gonna throw some shots of it on screen. I'm gonna look at them here myself. So it's from Mark Willis Simeon uh, from Flow Rider Racing. And he's done lots of custom bikes over the years. The photos, by the way, are from excellent Andre Mora. Um, superb shots on here, I've got to say. I uh, really appreciate that from the photography point of view. Now, the thing that's really cool about this bike, and I could see it, but without even reading what Mark had written here, is the nod to Palmer's 1995 Intense. So here's a little quick pick of that Intense, just as a flashback there, and you can see exactly where this has come from. A bit of a modern classic, but um, it's very cool, and it's based around those really cool Revel bikes. So it's a 29er, um, 130 mil rear, 140 mil travel up front. Um, super cool, aggressive, playful bike but we don't really need to talk about that at the moment because I'm just gonna go through these pictures because it's absolutely nuts what this bike has got on it. So up front, you might notice it's got an Intend fork on it. So that's actually a new fork that hasn't been released yet. You're gonna find out about that very shortly on the channel, not on today's show, but probably on next week's show. Now it's got Hutchinson Tamworth tires on there, which kind of make it look like a period old bike. It's got the EXT shock with the custom colored spring on there, which I, I love. That looks so much like Palmer's bike at a glance. Um, of course, the geometry is way more modern on this, but even the stems, I see and seed alloy stem on there, just to look like the old Azonic Shorty style stem that Palm used to run. The Vans decal on the chainstay. I mean, in fact, all of the decals, the period decals, pretty much the Oakley braking Vans. Uh, Rev Grips obviously is more modern, Troy Lee designs. The logo is not really changed, so kind of retro. Dude, the build is just off the charts on this thing, absolutely incredible. Um, I'm just cycling through the shots myself looking at them. Yeah, the rev grips, of course, they're very modern. Great looking cockpit. Oh, look at that from the front on. Just looks absolutely bitching, that bike does. I, I think he's done an amazing job with this. I feel like I really need to do a, do a sort of a go to town job on a bike. I've never done anything this custom. Uh, the closest I got was building up a replica GT Zaska of like a 25 year anniversary model. Um, I even got hope to fire up the anodizers for that one and do everything in purple anodized for me, which wasn't cool, which it is now. Um, kind of it was uh, coming around to the retro thing again, but um, oh, look at it alongside the little balance bike here as well. How sick is that? I love it. Oh, I'm gonna need one of those soon in my life. Well, not that soon, but in a few years time, I'm gonna need one of those for little Dustin. Clearly he's gonna be getting on a bike as soon as he can. Whether he wants to stick with it or not, it's up to him, but um, <clears throat> I'm not gonna be a nice hockey dad and push him if he doesn't want to. But uh, the bike just looks amazing. Beautiful cranks on there, pedals, just the whole thing just looks amazing. Um, so I'm getting carried away with the images here because these are really, really nice photos as well. And I think they agree with me, the colors look pretty wild. It definitely has that kind of factory race feel about it. I mean, this is about as far as you can go on a top mod, a completely custom bike, custom paint job, custom decals, and it's kind of inspired by an old 90s downhill bike. Mega, mega cool. And there's that rear hub there, so you've got the Onyx hub on there. They've got those super fast cloud, um, Sprag clutch hubs on them. Um, mega cool. Yeah, look at it. Oh man, I can't believe how good it looks. It's funny, like someone on our audience development team actually commented saying, oh, not really into that bike, but um, I had to disagree with them straight away because I think the thing is wild. In fact, put me out of my misery. Do you agree with me? And do you think this bike looks amazing? Or do you think it looks a bit random and you're not really sure what it's based on? Let us know in those comments underneath and we're gonna let this guy know about it because I think it's really cool and I think that you're also gonna appreciate it. But um, hey, I might be completely wrong. I've been wrong about many things before, <laughs> but um, I think it looks absolutely mega. Bright yellow, red back end, Onyx hubs. There's Griffiths tires again. There's like PT's valve stems on there. Looks like PT's to me. Uh, carbon rims. Oh man, even the saddle looks a little bit reminiscent of the old sort of uh, Kevlar saddles used to see back in the day. Uh, SCG used to make those, of course, and then um, various other brands out there. But let's just see a little bit more, a uh, few more detail shots whizzing past your way. Just want to see. So Mark says, um, special thanks must go to Stefan over at Cycle Works for the fabulous paint job and the old school stickers. Yep, super cool. Um, and he goes, the bike unfolds to its full effect when you listen to music from Rage Against the Machine. Yeah, I could see that. Or actually, maybe a bit of downset. 
put it down to M Power. That's the tune for that bike, surely, because that's a bit more chain smoke and that. But um, yeah, mega, mega cool. Uh, love what you've done with it. Anything else to mention on the spec? Yeah, Revel RW30 carbon rims, Onyx Hubs mentioned that. Uh, C1 custom color saddle by C-Tech. Okay, that's great. I did wonder who the saddle was. Yeah, the story of lock shock with a custom color spring. Yes, and a brand new fork being announced very soon. Uh, Mark, really appreciate you sending these images in. What a job you have done. Um, maybe we should do a collab, get a bike together between us. Um, I love the direction you pick with these. and I love the fact it's quite a different bike as well. The Revel's a really cool bike to do it with. Um, yeah, I love your work, dude. Um, and if you fancy doing a collab of some kind, hey, I've never done a collab with anyone before, so uh, get involved. Uh, thanks a lot. See you later, guys. And now it's time for Rewind. This is the old school part of the show where we go back in time to see where all the cool stuff now came from. It obviously started in the early days, uh, the early 90s, where really mountain biking started kicking off. And towards mid 90s, things really got fired up. And that's when we started seeing loads of wacky frame designs. Every material under the sun was messed with. Metal matrix composite, carbon fiber, steel, prestige, titanium, literally, anything went in those days and as a result you just saw some insane stuff so if you've got anything old school send it in there's a link at the bottom of the screen there uh, there's a better one underneath actually you can click on straight through to our uploader now the first picture this one is from Nils in um, Hamburg in Germany he says hi I've got this 26 inch dirt jump bike a few years back and um, sorry I've got this 26 inch bike dirt cheap a few years back and I've not yet found out what type of shift dirt brake this is. I'm just going to stop you there and just tell you it's the worst thing that Shimano have ever made. Um, I love Shimano, I'm such a huge fan of it but this product alone, this was their dual control shifters, taking the same concept essentially as what you see on road bikes where you're using the brakes but you can change gear with the brakes, it makes perfect sense on a road bike because you need the ultimate control, kind of like paddle shifting on a, on a fast car really. You don't need that on a mountain bike and in fact on mountain biking when you're off-road, you're moving up and down quite a lot. You're getting shocks transmitted through the handlebars. A lot of riders, including myself, will rest fingers on the brake levers. And with those things, you'd end up accidentally changing gear. You go to pedal, you crunch your way through the gears. Um, it just wasn't a good idea for mountain biking. Although, to be fair, it worked really, really well. Um, but they were never that much fun to ride. I actually went on the launch of those. Um, they launched at the XTR level. Of course, we know this with Shimano. They launch at the top level and they filter the technology down. I don't think they ever got below XT though. So um, it says quite a lot about it. I might be wrong on that. But, um, so we went on the launch, which was at Caprona in Austria. And we rode the XC World Cup course there on, um, on I think they were, might have even been a rigid bike in, at that time. Now I went along on the launch. So. The brakes were switched the wrong way around, and due to the design of the hydraulic version size, so they later did cable ones, uh, the hydraulic ones, they couldn't actually swap the hoses for, for the journalist on there. So having to ride a World Cup cross-country course in the Alpine um, in pretty horrendous conditions with the brakes the wrong way around, that was just like death for me. Um, and then they also had rapid rise gears as well, so the gears changed the opposite way around to the way you changed, and then the gears worked counterintuitively. Um, by going up and down with the brake levers as you would expect. So pretty much every turn you came around, you'd shift up into a high gear instead of a low gear, crunch your way through the gears. I think a couple of journalists broke chains just from like misuse of the bikes, but um, it was a crazy experience and I'm glad they don't exist anymore. But um, they do work well, so if you can get on with them, I guess they'd kind of be pretty useful. Um, other than that, just um, kill them with fire, I think. Okay, so next up, this is from Paul in Ontario, Canada. Now, this is wicked, a 1989 Kona Syndicone. Now, note it's got the sloping top tube on there, slopes back towards the seat. Now, very early mountain bikes, so I use Trek as a prime example because they made really advanced bikes from it off, but all their bikes tended to have flat top tubes or even, depending on the size, slightly downward sloping towards the handlebars. Now, this was something we saw on road bikes and it definitely wasn't something that suited mountain bikes, but Kona, got this nailed the first time with their bikes and it had a slightly longer head tube on there a more aggressive stance of the bike and even look at it I mean it's an old bike but it doesn't look that out of date if you look at the frame geometry on it the back end's fairly long the head angle slackish for for back then you've got the sloping top tube they just did it right awesome bike so um Joe Murray is part of the design with them and he now works with various companies including Shimano Skunk Works uh, loads of cool stuff going on there so uh, what have you got on here then so Pull stoplights on the front and rocks with Judy's and you've got speed springs in them as well. Very nice, so coil operated. So they had the brakes, awesome looking set of cantilevers those. Insanely powerful from what I remember. And I forget the brand, it might, might be Marin or Marin. Um, they made 
their own in-house version of those, but they were quite a bit shorter, but they were like the poor man's version of those because they were not cheap, that's for sure. So, well, XT Mech on the back, a shark fin on the front there, and so that was to stop the chain getting wedged in between the chain and the chain stay. Race face cranks. Oh, there's the pull stop light on the front there. Oh, look at that bad boy. Really, really nice. And then the Judy's, of course, with the speed springs on the inside, so mountain speed. Um, mountain speed speed springs, was that not, um, that's MRP, isn't it? Mountain speed racing. Was that them in the early days? Am I totally making it up? I'm pretty sure it might be the same company. But um, super cool to see. And uh, last one this week actually is a Kona Sex One. So Kona have had some interesting names over the years for their bikes, and they made the Sex One. Um, I kind of forget what it stands for. Someone please correct me in the comments underneath. You have something about a suspension. X, I don't know, I can't remember. I can't remember what sort of weird acronyms they were using, but um, it says, after seeing my Blake-inspired bike cave build, I remember seeing this actually on one of the bike caves before. Um, after seeing this, including a mint sauce themed wallpaper, a mate of mine who used to race in the 90s asked if I'd want to be interested in an old bike he had. When he sent photos, I couldn't believe it. It was a Kona Sex One, custom finished in polished aluminium, paste forks, Hope Big and Hubs, Sax wavy twist grips, Magura brakes, Mavic 121 rims, that was the downhill rim back then, uh, x light seat posts and Kevlar saddle, x light bars with the cross brace. Uh, gonna rebuild it to perfection. Possibly change the shifters out to some period triggers, but other than that, um, a preppy, a 90s dream bike. Putting it next to my current Orange 5 shows you how far we've come. Dude, that's awesome. You've got the original crud catcher on there as well. So Kona have done loads of suspension designs over the years. In fact, you know, everyone knows Kona for their classic, like the stinky style platform, which was uh, a faux bar. So they got this design when they actually, the downhill racing we're using turners badged up as Kona's and the turners of course use a four bar design which means they had a chainstay link the horse link because of the licensing on them Kona didn't go that way they made their single pivot linkage activated but at a glance it looks the same but actually it worked really well for them and they had all sorts of bikes including the stab downhill bike the stinky stinky deluxe and then all the other bikes that came off the back of it like the bear and there's, there's a whole host of them but actually before that Kona had loads of different suspension designs they had unified triangles they had the uh, the single pivot linkage designs you see here like the sex one they just, they've done so many different designs over years. In fact, I feel like I'm doing a bit of a case study on Kona because I've always loved the brand. Joe, you know, I've never owned a Kona. Um, the longest I had a Kona for was a test bike, it's the Process 111. Um, still one of the most fun bikes I've ever ridden. I kind of fancy a Kona again. It's um, nice. Okay, so there's a Hope Biggin front hub. I had a set of these on an old uh, ATX 1000 I had. Look at that, beautiful looking hubs. Of course, they were, uh, after a while, I often thought they were a bit ludicrously big, so they went for the bulb, which was like the slim down version, and quite a lot cooler, I think. But the big one, look at that, bad boy. Looks like a motorbike hub. And there you go, so you can see that bike with the uh, the linkage there is just on the seat stay, and then of course you've got the rocker drive and the shock mounted under the top tube. Doesn't look far off what people are doing today. Of course, the uh, high top tube there and the steep angles, uh, not quite so modern. But that Rook stem, they were so popular. I remember a lot of people having those. Jamie Hibbard, actually, he used to work on MBUK just before me. He had a really nice Turner, which was bright yellow, and he had one of, he actually had a, um, I lie, he had a synchro stem, but almost the same angles as that. Uh, yeah, of course, the downhill bars, the sax wavy grips, the Yeti uh, handlebar grips there, they leave ite, ite written in your hand. Yeah, mega cool to see that. Oh, I lie, we have got one more this week. Um, I'm gonna hold it actually, because this is a corker. We're gonna have this one in next week. But um, awesome selection of stuff there. Really cool to see that Kona actually, because they're quite rare these days. You don't really see many of the old Konas. Maybe they just got ridden until they're dead or thrashed within an inch of their life. But um, either way, really cool to see all the old school stuff. So uh, until this time next week, see you later. Now it is time for the tech quiz answers. So first question, has the Trek Slash been available to buy over the years in each of the three wheel sizes. It is of course true. Yes, it has, it started out 26, then 650, then 29. And um, yeah, so true for that one. The second question, and it's actually something we've spoken about sporadically over, over the years. And this one is, what was Cane Creek previously known as? And it was Diacomp, who did loads of manufacturing of things like headsets and even some manufacturing of forks for other companies back in the day. And the final question, when did the carbon Mondraker Summon break cover? And it was late 2014 
with the model year of 2015. So I'll let you have either on that account. Now guys, thank you very much for watching this week's GMBN Tech Show. Please don't forget to like and subscribe to show your support for the channel and we'll see you next time. Thanks.